Hey, we're looking at system security now. We've covered networks, and network security falls under this category of system security, but also looking at just protection of systems, uh, computers, and also programs and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. And um, this is a very common definition, but it covers all the bases we'll be looking at. Specifically, first of all, we're going to talk about security threats, so threats to systems. Let's firstly look at some forms of attack. So as we've talked about, having access points to a network or a system in general creates these vulnerabilities where there's this access point to data. So the more access points, the more vulnerabilities you have. And an actual attack, if we can define it, is when data is viewed or vandalized without authorization. And this is quite a specific um, it's two words because um, it's not necessarily legal. You can think when a government is doing this, like the NSA in America or GCHQ in the UK, when they're kind of hacking into people's systems, they're doing it legally because they've got that power to do it. But they're not doing it without. We're not doing it with authorization, so it would fall under this this uh, term. So attacks can be classified in four main ways. The first kind of pair of ways you talk about is being passive or active. So in passive attacks, data isn't actually changed, it's when it's viewed in this case, the data is monitored, or it can be active where actually data is vandalized, it's modified. So passive would be an example of wiretapping, which isn't which used to be literally just connecting to wires, but now just means kind of viewing data, um, or active like through malware. Attacks can also be classified in terms of being inside, i.e. done by someone who works for the organization, somebody who's got access from the inside or outside done by someone external to the organization and apparently um, I forget where I got this source from maybe a dodgy one I don't know uh, apparently 60% of security breaches come from the inside so that's maybe more than you'd imagine I mentioned it just now we've got to look at malware in a bit more detail which is an umbrella term for any hostile or intrusive software some malicious software in other words and as I said it's used in active attacks so we're going to look at a few examples of the main examples of malware most of we, most of these you would have heard of maybe you don't necessarily know how they work exactly so viruses first of all they're unique because they insert themselves in normal programs so like a virus when you get ill inserts itself into your your body cells um, a virus will insert itself into the, the code of a normal program so when this host program a program that's been infected gets executed when you run it the virus code gets run as well so it links itself to a program on your computer something very similar are worms which are like viruses but spread autonomously so a virus doesn't necessarily spread on its own but a worm that's kind of its whole purpose they are is a very fine line between the two to be honest and a key characteristic of worms they often overload networks by spreading so fast they kind of spam the network essentially overloading it um, a third type which is different and this is based on I think the Greek story of, of the Trojan horse and these are installed on computers disguised as desirable software so you'll download some software thinking it's something you want like a normal game or a normal program but actually it's got some malware hidden within it uh, this Trojan. The next type is spyware which collects data about activities on the computer so it spies on your activities as you could guess when it sends it back to the instigator of the attack so you know recording passwords entered it'll, it'll track all your keyboards but it'll be able to track you know your passwords and your details and so on and it sends it back to the originator of the attack the final category we'll look at is adware which is definitely intrusive software um, it's not necessarily hostile but it may kind of lead you to download viruses and so on uh, it generates unwanted adverts to make money for whoever started the attack like pop-ups are unclosable uh, it's probably less common now but I'm sure you've all come across adware to some extent. But anyway, these are the, these are the main um, types of malware you'll come across. We now need to cover some more security threats. It's a lot of learning this video, I'm afraid. It is a very interesting topic, but you need to learn the basics first. So a term that often comes up is phishing, and you may have heard of this. It is actually based on phishing. You're kind of reeling someone in by disguising the message in order to obtain sensitive information. So you get an email that looks like it's from your bank or from your school and actually it links to something that's completely different so it could link to some other malware and that's what phishing is called. I'm sure you've come across that as well. This is actually in particular an example of social engineering. Phishing itself isn't, you know, it's not done by a programmer it's not code. It's an example of actually trying to manipulate someone through something called social engineering which is exploiting the fact that often people are the weak points in systems and so you manipulate people to access the data. Another term we'll come across is a lot less elegant than any of these methods. You've got to give some credit to people who do social engineering, however bad it is. A brute force attack is when you literally just try all possible combinations in the hope of eventually getting it right. With In, in certain cases this is quite a good option in some ways but 
you know, it gets to a point when you increase the size of passwords or all the information you need to access the system, it just becomes not feasible to do brute force attacks. So stating the obvious a bit, but the longer the password is, the harder it is because there's more combinations to try. And so adding more steps to the login can also uh, reduce the chance of a, a brute force attack working. Lots of you would have heard of denial of service attacks, and this is when an network resource becomes deliberately overloaded, so someone's deliberately trying to overload a resource or flooding a resource with unnecessary requests preventing it from responding normally. So we talked about the client-server relationship, and in this case, a client is trying to overload the server by sending so many requests that it can't respond normally to you know, your everyday uh, web accesses. And you probably actually heard the term DDoS rather than just DOS. So a distributed attack, which is what the extra D is for, um, it comes from multiple locations, so multiple sources. A denial of service attack isn't necessarily from multiple sources, but a DDoS is. And for most web servers, it needs to be it needs to be so many computers that it is massively distributed. So you, it does make a hard result. You can't just block a single IP address because it's coming from so many. So you can get like live maps of these happening around the world, which are quite cool to look at. This is from quite a severe one to, I think, data centers in the US from Asia, usually. Um, there's a few usual suspects with DDoSs and you can see that it's coming from those different locations and it's very hard to just block an IP address and you can see that, well you can imagine that the servers in America would get massively overloaded by all these sudden requests deliberately trying to flood it. So a attack that requires a bit more knowledge is SQL injections and SQL stands for Structured Query Language, it's a language for interacting with databases and so when you have a website linked to a database like most websites, in fact pretty much all websites and you actually allow the user to enter information, which is which is not as common, but still happens a lot. If you think on how many websites you search for information or enter details, that's what I mean by this. It's vulnerable to SQL injection. So any website linked to a database with user input. And as I say, SQL is used to interact databases with statements. So for example, this statement might be embedded in some server-side code like PHP. So we're selecting everything from this table where the name, which is a column in this table, equals some variable called user input. So this is what the input of the user would be. So for example, if Harry was the input in our text box, then this variable would be replaced with Harry and just the rows with Harry would be returned from this statement. So everything works fine in that case. But however, if we entered the following into the textbook, so not just Harry, we're now putting a semicolon and drop table students. So it will behave like it's been queried twice. It, it doesn't distinguish between, the database doesn't doesn't matter if it's on the same line, it's absolutely fine. So what will happen is the first statement will be executed, which we looked at before, exactly the same, Harry gets replaced by the user input variable. So this is absolutely fine, it works as normal, but however the second part of this will execute like drop table students because the semicolon tells it that it's finished with the first statement and then the second statement will get executed. And this has the effect of deleting the table along with all the data. Drop is the delete command in SQL, as you may know. So this is an example of malicious code, and it doesn't have to just be deleting, it can be anything in the database, you know, returning credit card information for someone else, for example, or, or everyone. And this isn't very common, you don't hear about SQL injection attacks very often. That's not because it's hard, because it's clearly not, it's because every web developer knows about it. It's not like it's a, a secret that only a few people know about. It's kind of assumed that you would have done some validation in your code. It's not hard to validate um, to ensure this doesn't happen, to ensure it doesn't go direct to the database. So this isn't very common, but if you are going to develop a website, you need to know about this, and most people, if they're qualified, uh, do know about it.